First Timothy chapter 3, the Bible says, This is a true saying, If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Father, we come before you, Lord, I just ask you to help us as we, Lord, understand what you require in a pastor, in a man that's going to administer the ordinances of your kingdom. And Lord, I pray you teach us and help us to understand the importance of these qualifications. And Lord, just thank you for giving us your word and thank you that we can know without a doubt that we have it in its perfect form. Without error, Lord, we thank you and praise you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we are looking now. <clears throat> we looked at the man's personal life. Again, there's three areas a pastor to be is to be blameless in. Help me out. What are those three areas? Family, personal, ministry. Okay, so we've looked at personal, and now we're starting on family, his family life. Now, the personal has the most qualifications as you break them down and begin looking at all of them. But sometimes it's just one word. What gets the most attention as far as the number of words given to that qualification is dealing with his family. Okay, it, it takes up, at least right here, you know, two whole verses dealing with the man's family. So this is hugely important. They all are important, but especially this. And there's a reason why. We'll just kind of jump ahead to why, and I'll probably hit on it throughout the message. But it says there in verse 5, here's the reason why. It's in parentheses. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? And you can look at that parentheses like God's just kind of telling you, here's what I'm thinking in my head. Okay, here's kind of where I'm going with this and why he needs to be one that rules well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. Because if this man doesn't know how to rule his own house, how shall he, how's he going to take care of the church of God? You see, that, that's so huge right there. Because if he can't take care of his house, then guess what else he can't take care of? God's house. It's that simple. This is huge to look at in somebody's life. I mean, it is huge. We'll spend more time on it, obviously, as we get into it. But again, a uh, pastor is to be blameless in those three areas, his personal life, family life, and ministry life. <clears throat> now, all of those three areas make for a well-rounded person, but also one that can be an example to others in word and deed. Okay, and again, all of us should strive for this. These are good qualities for every single one of us to strive for. And we really should look at doing this. And as we do this, we'd be a well-rounded person as far as God sees it. And we would be a, a, a shining example to others, which is what all of us should be anyway. I mean, we're to be salt and light, bringing people to Christ. And it's through our testimony. The Bible a lot of times uses the word our conversation to describe that very thing, our manner of life, the way in which we live everywhere, not just when we're in front of church people, but everywhere. What's our manner of life? Paul told Timothy... In uh, 1 Timothy 4.12, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers. Be an example of them. How? In word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. This is how he's to, to be an example of them in, his, in word, in, in conversation, charity, spirit, faith, purity. Your manner of life, in other words, is what he's saying. This is how you ought to live your life, that you are an example to the other believers. Now, I believe God requires this blamelessness in a pastor's life, because people cannot stand a hypocrite and look for any excuse possible to reject God. And if they see it in the preacher, they're like, I'm done with that. That stuff is so fake. I want nothing to do with that. I mean, they'll do it with, with just believers, okay, as well. I mean, they'll just look at you. You say you're a Christian, and if there's just, I mean, you just have a bad day, okay? Maybe you say something you shouldn't have, and they're like, see, a Christian, huh? I mean, you can't even make a mistake if you, you say you're a Christian. Uh, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about someone that's a hypocrite, okay? Someone that's a complete hypocrite. Uh, if you say you're a Christian, but you live as a hypocrite, you don't live what you say. It doesn't even matter what you say. 
you say you're a Christian and you don't live what this book says, they're going to use that as an excuse. But it's even more so with the preacher. If it's the preacher, they're going to be like, see, that's exactly why I'm against religion. Organized religion right there. I want nothing to do with that. Look at that. Preacher's a fake, a phony, a fraud. So it's all that much more important that the pastor really does live this stuff out. Okay, He needs to be blameless in his life. So because people will use that as an excuse to wreck reject God, his ministers must be godly examples. Be thou an example of the believers. So with that, we come to the man's family life. It's of utmost importance because you will learn a great deal about a leadership, about the leadership a church will receive based on what the man's family looks like. Just look at it, and you're going to see, is his family in order, or is his family out of order? Does he, has fa does he have his family under control, or is it the other way around? And that's going to tell you what kind of pastor you're going to have. Right there. That's what God said all that. That's what God said. You watch this in his life. Because if he can't rule his own family, he's got no business over my house. And if we're executors of his kingdom, then we don't get to say, well, but he's a good guy in all these other areas. He meets all the other qualifications. God says, I don't care. If he can't do this, he's proving to you already he's not capable of being one of my shepherds. So, a bishop needs to be blameless in his family life. <clears throat> There's really two areas this deals with. It speaks of his marital relationship and then his relationship with his children. And even some of that will fall in just as a family in general. Okay, so it says in verse 2, A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife. This has been so controversial that it's amazing, the husband of one wife, what that means. <clears throat> if you go back to Bible times, when this was written amongst Jews, amongst Gentiles, polygamy was huge. And that's mostly what this is dealing with, is polygamy, not having more than one wife. And that's how they would have taken it, is that that's what it's dealing with. I also believe that it's speaking of um, the man can't be divorced and remarried. And the reason why is because it represents, the, the marriage represents Christ and His bride. It's something holy and pure, and it needs to be kept holy and pure. So the man needs to be the husband of one wife. <clears throat> so, marriage represents God's relationship to His church, and since it does in the life of a minister, it should be pure. His marriage should be pure. This also, it can, okay, it depends on when the divorce took place, but this can speak poorly of the man's ability to rule well his own house. Okay, now I would say, someone wants to argue and say, well, I believe a divorced person can be, can be a pastor. Okay, let me set that aside for just a sec, but <clears throat> because he was divorced before he got saved. Okay, whatever. Well, I think that because it represents... It's a picture of Christ's relationship with His church. It needs to be pure. And that's why I say that's a no. So he needs to be the husband of one wife. Okay? But it speaks poor of His ability to rule His house if this is something that happened while He's saved. He gets a divorce. You have proven that you're not qualified. You don't rule well your own house. Period. Because look, here's what it is. Now the qualifications given are for the man. But if you have a stubborn and rebellious wife, you can't do it. Yep. You can't be a pastor. Amen. Period. You, you, sorry, you're not qualified. Amen. Because you need to rule well your house. Let me put that in today's language. That means you're the head of the home as the husband. That means what you say goes. That means it's my way or the highway. I'm not saying you want your wife to leave or anything like that, but you get what I'm saying, that it's what you say. Amen. Because look, if, if, if you're both biblically submitted to God, then a, a submissive wife understands 
that her husband is going to answer to God for the way this family is brought up in a way she never will. Amen. And go back to Eve. She didn't answer for this mess we're in. Adam did. Right. And that's the first example. Okay, law first mention right there. Who got the blame? Adam. So if a wife is not submitted, you are not qualified. Amen. Now, look, I'm just telling you this. You better watch this stuff. We as a church better watch this stuff as we ordain men to, to be pastors. Because here's what will happen. You ordain a man whose wife runs the home. Then you're going to have a wife that eventually runs a church. Amen. Because she's going to say, I don't want to do that. We're not doing that. Amen. She might not say it like that, but her husband knows that she doesn't. He's, my wife ain't going to do that. We're, we just, no. And let me say one further here. Let me throw this out. The wife has got to be an example. Yep. Look, if I talk and preach soul winning, soul winning, soul winning, soul winning, we need to go do it. We need to go do it. My wife doesn't ever go. What does that say about my house? Well, it'll tell you one thing. I'm not ruling my house. I don't rule her. That's what it'll tell you. It'll tell you I'm not qualified. If my wife isn't on board with what I'm doing, I'm not ruling my house well. Amen. Now, let me also say that just because maybe you're not there right now doesn't mean you can't be. But you have to be able to rule your house to rule your children. <coughs> That's what this means. So you need to have a wife that is submitted as well. Amen. So you young men that aren't married, I'm like, you better take heed to the woman you marry. Man, you better watch that girl and make sure she submits to her father. Amen. I'm telling you, that's the number one way you're going to know. Does she submit to her father? If she does not submit to her father, I don't care what she tells you right now. Yep. I don't care if she listens to you right now. She's going to get used to you, and she's eventually going to tell you, you're not my daddy. Don't tell me what to do. Well, you didn't listen to him. Why are you going to listen to me? You want nothing to do with that girl. I don't care how beautiful she is. I don't care how much she tells you she loves you. If she don't listen to her dad, she will not listen to you. Period. I don't care what she says. I don't care. Unless God just gets a hold of her, but if God gets a hold of her, she'll start listening to her dad. Amen. Don't put yourself in that. Don't marry somebody like that. You're asking for a nightmare. You're asking for a divorce. Amen. I'm just telling you right now, you're asking for a divorce. If you do that, that's what you're asking for. Don't put yourself in that situation. Take heed. Don't be another statistic. Don't be like, I'm going to prove them wrong. You're a fool. Yep. You're an absolute fool if that's what you think. Sometimes The devil will send you somebody sometimes too. Okay, God sent him. I asked about this and God sent him. God may be testing you. Oh, you want to be a preacher, huh? How much are you willing to obey my word? See, lay hands suddenly on no man, but prove these things. Prove it. Prove the man first. That means test him. Try him. So he has to rule his own house well. It is, it, if he gets a divorce, it speaks poorly of his ability to rule well his own house. He obviously didn't have rule over his wife. Now, this also doesn't mean he's some mean dictator either. All right, now there's, I'm just saying there's going to be times as a husband, you're going to have to put your foot down and say, no, this is what's happening. This is how it's going to be. But also with that, you are a shepherd of your home. I'm not saying you're a pastor of your home, okay? Don't get me mixed up with that. That's not what I'm saying, but you do lead your home. You don't drive them, you lead them. That means you lead by example. That means you show compassion. That means you show kindness. That means you, when you're wrong, you go and apologize and seek forgiveness. That's what that means as well. You lead in those areas also. You show them. Show your wife how to admit when she's wrong by admitting when you're wrong and apologizing and saying, I was wrong. Show your children the same thing. I don't care if they're two years old and you lose your temper on them. 
go and apologize to them. You're teaching them. You're training them. Tell them I was wrong. You have to lead in every area. It's not just I get to be the boss. I honestly I don't want it. It's a, it's it's weight on your shoulder. It is, but you have to take it. This is the position that God has put you in, or will if you're not married and you have to take that. So it doesn't mean you're a dictator either, but you do need to rule well your own house. <clears throat> All right, so if one wants to argue that it was before the person got saved, I still say, talking about the husband of one wife, I still say he's unqualified and that God wouldn't have given this requirement and then called a man to preach. Because it represents his marriage, his, his Christ and his church. That's what marriage represents. It says the husband of one wife, not many wives. So if, well, I, I, it happened before I was saved. Okay, let's say you've had two, three divorces. Where do we draw the line? I mean, what, your pattern here isn't looking too good. So if somebody wants to argue and say, well, I believe divorced men can be pastors, well, go for it. Good. They won't be here unless the Lord tells me otherwise, shows us something else in the Bible, and it's not going to happen here. I say you're unqualified. Why did God give it? The husband of one wife. Now, I did not... Don't, don't mistake this. I did not say that a man who's divorced cannot get remarried. I did not say that. I don't believe that's sin. So don't mistake that because there's those that teach that basically you got to never get married again. And I don't, I've, I've gone through that. I've taught on that when we were in 1 Corinthians 7. I, I took us through and taught on that. I'm not going to take the time to do that now. But you can see clearly that it's it's allowed, okay? So I didn't say that a man cannot get remarried if he's been divorced, or a woman cannot get remarried if she's been divorced. Now, if you've been divorced, let me say if you have been divorced and you're seeking to get remarried, now, look, obviously you're like not under the authority of your parents anymore, typically at that time if that's happened. Okay, but for a lady especially, for a man also, for both really, you, you better seek your pastor's advice. I'm just telling you, get an outsider's that has some godly wisdom, get an outsider's opinion of is this a good match? Does this person, and maybe they need to come around, people need to get to know them so they can see some things about them and see if this is good. Don't just jump into it because, oh, you know, it's puppy love and we're just, we just met and everything's perfect and we're, none of us have any flaws. We don't sin yet in front of each other because, you know, we're embarrassed to do that still, you know, so everything's good. And then, oh, life happens and man, I don't even like this person. Seriously, don't jump into it. Don't do that. Amen. Protect yourself. Seek some counsel from eyes that are fresh on the situation, okay? Now, again, I said this includes polygamy, which was popular with both Jews and Gentiles. So, that's the qualification. He must be the husband of one wife. And then verse 4, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. So, this man, we're going to go to Titus as well, the pastor-to-be, needs to rule well his own house, having faith, excuse me, faithful children. This is a requirement. So first we see that he, one that ruleth well his own house. So he needs to rule his house. This first means, I said this earlier, but he leads. Okay, if, if you're ruling, that means you're leading, you're a leader. The leader is in front. You know what the leader does? The leader guards the door. The leader protects what's going to come in. The leader's the filter. That puts you also at a attack point for Satan. This is why it's good that a family prays for their father or husband. Because he is the, the point, the point man, so to speak. He's at the front. But you have to guard what comes in because you're in front. 
everything gets screened through you. I had my family kind of mock me for Christmas when they were talking about my daughter's dating. And I said, I don't even remember exactly what I said, but something along the lines of, well, they won't be doing any of that until I meet them first. And they were just like, okay. And then kind of the subject got changed. Well, because our family's got a good track record of matches going well that the children decided on their own. I'm being sarcastic. We have a horrible track record. Divorces or no marriages at all. So let's do it that way that hasn't worked for generations. That's excellent. Versus God's way. So you got to be willing to take the ridicule. You have to lead. You have to be in front and it's to protect your family. You're their first line of defense. It's you. Humanly speaking anyway, obviously God protects all of us. But God's order has been husband first. The husband protects. And that's what he's to be, the first line of defense. So ladies, when you're looking for a man, look look for a man that is going to, that loves his mother, that protects his mother, protects his sisters, loves his sisters. I'm not talking about a brother like punching a sister in the arm or something. That, he should do that. Okay, that's, you know, when my, my brother-in-law picks on my wife, I'm like, hey, I get her. Uh, but Because I can't do it. <laughs> I'm not talking about just brother, brothers and sisters picking on each other. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about he actually will protect her. Look for that in him. Look for how his relationship is with his mom. Is he respectful of his mother? If he's not respectful of his mother, run. Run! Just like the, the, the girl that won't submit to her father, if a boy is disrespectful of his mother, you want nothing to do with him. Get away from him. Even if he's disrespectful to his sisters. And I get you have to weigh that because brothers and sisters fight. I get that. But there should be an amount of respect there as well. And if that's not there, run. Have nothing to do with him. And you want to watch that. You want to see that. Fathers, you're going to want to see that stuff too. A potential suitor. How, how is this boy with his mom? I want to see. You, you want to see all of that stuff. I know I'm kind of getting off here, but it's just I want to just touch on these things, okay? So, he needs to rule his house and he needs to lead, okay? As you look at the definition of rule, it has the idea of leading people straight. Think of a ruler. Isn't that what you get? I need to draw a straight line. So what do you get? A ruler. Well, that's what it means to rule. You're going to lead them straight. I think I've read that somewhere in the Bible before. Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Straight is the gate, narrow is the way. And see, a husband, a biblical husband, and especially one seeking to be a pastor, one that desires the office of a bishop, needs to rule his own house. That means he needs to lead them straight. He needs to lead them in the ways of God. All the ways of God, not most of the ways of God, all the ways of God. If he's not doing that, he's not ruling his house. And you know this man's not qualified. He is a man that is capable of and does in fact govern his family in a certain direction with a specific purpose. He governs his family in a certain direction with a specific purpose. Now for all of us, that should be obvious. What is that direction and purpose? To glorify God, to serve God. I mean, how there's a bunch of ways you can word it, but that's essentially, it's to, to live for God. To seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. That's what the father, the husband, if he's ruling well, is doing. If he's ruling his house well, that's what he's doing. 
It says, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. It says house because that includes the wife. And then it goes on further to talk about the children. So he doesn't just talk about it or think it's a good idea, but in fact, he governs his family in a certain direction with a specific purpose. Now, I've touched on this, but I'm going to say it again. This means he rules his wife and not the other way around. There's a lot of preachers that are run by their wives. A lot. More than you think. There's a lot of preachers that are run by their wives. And look, every wife should have influence over her husband. I'm not saying that. But you can't let the woman lead. They're emotional creatures. They just are. You can't do that. Okay, you get Eve status when that happens. You can't do that. We have to guard against that. That was a husband's failure, in my opinion. And I think the Bible bears that out as well. So he rules his wife, not the other way around. It means he's not afraid to tell her to do something she may not want to do. Or I could rephrase that and say he does it anyway if he is afraid. Because you're not always going to want to. You're going to say, well, this isn't going to be a good day. But this is what's going to happen. Because you're ruling. You're leading them straight. You don't allow her to make the decisions. You don't. Especially if they're going away from God. You stop that. And I get you can't force somebody. Uh, your children will deal with that. But a wife, if she's just adamant about, I'm not doing that, you can't force her. But here's what you do do. You say, fine, you're in rebellion to me. You're in rebellion to God. But the children are going to do this. The children are. And look, I'm, I'm telling you, you put your foot down on that. You've got a rebellious wife. You don't give your children over to her. All the way and up to her leaving you if that's what happens. You, are you seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness? That's not going to be easy. I'm telling you right now, it won't be. But this is why I want to back up and say too, this is why it's so important who you marry as well. Don't put yourself in that situation. But look, if that's what it takes, you're like, look, I'm not looking for a divorce. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And if you're not on board with that, then that's your problem. Now, obviously, you get a divorce. You can't be a pastor. But you've proven one thing in that situation is that you're willing to rule your house. You may say, I've made some mistakes, but I'm going to rule my house. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord from here forward anyway. And you, you'd be willing to do that. If that's what it costs, that's what you do. You don't give your children. You're just giving them over to the devil then if you're going to allow some spouse to lead them off into error, sin, Amen. rejection of God and His kingdom through their manner of lifestyle, through their habits. You don't allow that. You say, you're not going to teach my children that. And it may be rough, but you, who do you love more? Who do you love more? You've got to decide. I'm, this is serious stuff. This is no joke stuff. Do I love God more or do I love my spouse more? And ask yourself this. Put it to yourself like this. Do I love my spouse so much that I'm willing to let them lead my children to hell? It's that serious. Amen. If they're not willing to walk with God, it is that serious. So you can't be afraid to tell her to do something that she may not want to do. All of this travels downhill. If the children see that mama doesn't listen to daddy, then the children are trained that it's normal to reject biblical authority. Amen. Look, if, if mom constantly tells dad, no, we're not doing that. The children say, this is dad's will. They hear dad say, this is what we want. This is what I want. And mama says, no, we're not going to do that. And the children witness both of this. 
then you've shown your children that biblical authority is not important. Amen. That's what you've taught them. So you've taught them, you've trained them, that it is okay for me to ignore God's Word. That's what you're training your children to do. Right. This is why, I mean, this is some serious stuff. Do you agree? Now, do you see why it's so important that a man that's going to be a pastor of God's church rules well his own house? Because if he can't rule his own house, how can he rule the church of God? It all travels downhill. And I've said it before, and I will say it again. Mom, don't be upset when your children reject your authority when all you've shown them is a rejection of your husband's authority. Don't be surprised. Be like, well, at least you're learning what I'm teaching you. You've learned well, children. You've learned well. Now, a man that rules well his own house is one that, is that is one that administers God's law in his home. That's part of the definition of to rule well. You administer God's law. Now, take that in connection with a minister, a pastor. What does he administer? God's law. We could say specifically two ordinances. He's the one that administers them. He's the administrator of them. And that's God's law. I mean, it's baptism and the Lord's Supper, but it's God's law. He administers God's law. You see how interconnected they are? They're parallel with each other. Does he administer God's law in his home? If he does, he'll do it over here. Got a pretty good idea he'll do it here. Does he not do it here? Then guess what he won't do here? He won't do it here. That's what you, it's that simple. God's made it that simple, that plain. The best way for any of us to do any of this stuff of ruling well is to lead by example. All of this stuff is to lead by example. Men that desire the office of a bishop, can you lead yourself? If you can't lead yourself, if you can't tell yourself no to something that you really desire, if you can't discipline yourself, there's a problem. It also goes on to say, 1 Timothy 3, 4, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. His children in subjection. Now, that means there is a willingness to follow their father. There's a willingness. Now, I understand when children are younger, you're completely training. I mean, it's just I'm just teaching obedience. Okay, this is specifically this children in subjection would deal with older children as they get up, you know, like 10, 11, 12 on up. There's a willingness on their behalf to follow their father. That's what you want to look for. Not a... And every kid's going to have that. But I'm talking about, is that how their life always is? Are they always like that? Well, I have to do that. No, there's a willingness. that his, Having his children in subjection with all gravity. A willingness to follow their father. Now, that willingness to follow their father comes about through training. You teach them at a young age, obedience. And mom, you can help more than anybody with this. You can help more than anybody with this. Because when daddy says something, it ought to be obeyed like that. And if you back up your husband, when he says something, the children maybe give some lip or something, whatever it is, you jump all over them. For the, You better obey your father. All you're doing is building him up and building up biblical authority in their eyes. And you're helping to train them to put themselves in subjection to their father. To willingly put themselves in subjection. Like I said, in the home, there is always training going on. 
always. We're either training for good or bad. That's it. Do you allow your children to talk back to you? Then you're training them not to be in subjection to, to you or their father or you as the father. Don't allow that. Kill that. Kill that. Don't allow your children to talk back to you. I can't understand that for the life of me. I mean, kids are just screaming at their parents. I'm like, what? look, every kid's going to do it. How do you handle it? That's the question. I can't believe how brave like little toddlers are. I'm, I'm serious. Like they, I'm thankful that they are not like grown size with that anger that they have, because they would just like unleash on people. We'd be just seeing bloody massacres all over the cities if if, if uh, uh, grown people had the mentality of of toddlers, because they just rage. I mean, they do. But they are brave. They are brave, and they're all going to do it, but how do you deal with it? How do you deal with it? What do we got going on back there, huh? <laughs> Through training, though, children put themselves under the authority of their father. At first, it's just simple. I'm training you to obey. But through training, as they get older and they can, I don't have to listen to them. I can get away with it. They voluntarily put themselves under the, the the authority of their father. And that's what you're looking for. This is why our parenting is so important, by the way, as well, to just a side note from this and a qualification as a pastor, because as, as if my children are willing to voluntarily put themselves under my authority or any of our authority as fathers, you know what you just trained them to do? Obey God. Obey God. Isn't that what we all want for our children? Now, look, I'm, saying, I'm not saying that some of the best training, the kids can't make their own decisions and do wrong. I'm not saying that. That happens. But why are we going to help that along? I don't want to help that. I want to encourage them to, to put themselves in subjection to myself. That's what I want to train them to do, that they'll willing, willingly subject themselves to my authority, to any father's authority. So, through training, the children put themselves under the authority of their father. This is, in fact, the same thing a congregation does when they voluntarily join a church to sit under the teaching and authority bestowed upon a pastor by God's Word. It's the same thing. A person voluntarily puts themselves under the authority of this church. And even the authority that that pastor has, because he rules. Go to Hebrews chapter 13, please. Look now, a pastor or a bishop then must be one that ruleth well his own house. Okay, a pastor. Now Hebrews 13, 7. Remember them which have the rule over you. Look at that. Who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow considering the end of their conversation. Look at their, their lifestyle. Look at it. There it is. Everything we're talking about. Remember them which have the rule over you. See, when you come in and you volunteer to be a member of a congregation, you are voluntarily putting yourself under the authority of that pastor. And it's the authority given to him by God's word. I'm not talking about some extra biblical authority, but it's the authority given to him by God's word, and he rules over you. Who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow. That's what they do. It's the word of God. They preach the word of God. Verse 17, obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves. Look, isn't that what we're talking about? This is what we expect of our children. This is what's required for the, the children of a pastor. If he wants to be a pastor, his children need to um, obey their father, put themselves in subjection with all gravity. And look, God says if he can't rule his house, guess what else he can't rule? Why? Because it's one and the same. The connections, you can see them right there. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give account. Father's got to answer for the way he raises his family, doesn't he? Pastor's got to answer for the way he raises a church. They have to give an account. 
And if he doesn't take the responsibility of his family serious, that he's going to have to give an account of that when he stands before God, he definitely won't do it of the church of God. So important, so important. The willing subjection is obviously something that is seen in the teen years on up. Because that's easier to see it there than the willing subjection with younger ones. It's more obedience training, as I said. But it can also be observed through the manner in which young children are dealt with or not dealt with at all. Okay, you can't necessarily see the willing subjection of a four-year-old or something, five-year-old, six-year-old, but you can see how their disobedience is dealt with by a parent. Is it dealt with? If it's not, then you know they're not ruling well their own house. Every child's going to act up. Every one. How is it dealt with? That's what you want to look for. Is the father like just missing in action and leaves the mom to deal with everything? Well, what's he going to do when there's a problem then with the church? Is he just going to leave it to somebody else to deal with? See the parallels. Watch what he does with his family. We'll see in the church. This is why it's so important. Something else to look for is a man that ignores his family, leaves his wife to deal with everything, especially young children. This is not what you should see in a pastor. Is he going to ignore the young Christian that makes a mess of things and not seek to help them? I mean, that's what happened. You got a little baby and the dad's just like, doesn't ever help with anything. Leaves the mom to do it all. But what are you going to do when you get young Christians that are babies in Christ and they're making a mess? You're just going to leave them to somebody else? You're going to help them? Will he ignore sin in the church if he ignores sin in his family? Look, disobedience is sin. If your child doesn't obey you, it's sin. If you tell them, hey, pick up that trash and throw it away for me, and they don't do it, that's sin. They're disobeying you. That's one of the Ten Commandments. Honor your father and mother. That, that goes beyond just the actual obedience. That means doing it with the right attitude, honor. Honor means obeying with the right attitude. So if they don't listen to what you tell them to do, that's sin. You have to deal with it. You can't just ignore it. You have to deal with it. So if he ignores that in his family, he'll ignore it in the church. Now all of these things in a man's life are telltale signs. <clears throat> so it says, One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. Okay, just seriousness is what that's talking about. Now let's go over, if we would, to Titus. It says, if any be blameless, the husband of one wife having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. So he needs to have faithful children. Albert Barnes said this, the word here is descriptive of those who had been well trained and were in due subordination. If a man's family were not of his character, if his children were insubordinate and opposed to religion, if they were decided infidels or scoffers, it would show that there was such a deficiency in the head of the family that he could not be safely entrusted with the government of the church. Now, again, I will say this, every, everything has to be taken on a case-by-case -case basis as well. This isn't just like one size fits all. Because if a man gets saved later in life and his children are already grown and out of his house and he begins learning all these things and, and then his children are what they are, then he can still be qualified to be a pastor. Okay, if not dealing with divorce here. But he's got grown children. He gets saved when he's 40 or something or whatever. And, and his children are mostly grown. And then he starts living for the Lord. God calls him to preach. You're going to have to look at different things within his family. How's he ruling it now? Okay? Th that's what you're going to have to look for. At those things. What's he do now with them? What, does he enable his adult children or something? I mean, you'd look for that. But for the most part, a man that age that is serious about Christ, he's going to be hopefully able to rule his house. You're going to have to watch him still, though, just like anybody. But I'm saying that doesn't disqualify someone in certain situations. You have to weigh each situation is different. And you've got to look at it for the context. What if a, a man and his wife don't have children? What do you do? Some actually believe, well, they can't be a pastor then. That's not what Timothy's saying. 
And if he has children, they're in subjection. Look at how he, does he rule his wife or does she rule him? And you have to look at different things. And we ask wisdom from God. I mean, that's why every situation is different. So his children need to be faithful, okay? The children need to be trustworthy. Trustworthy. That's what you're looking for in them. Could you trust them? If they're not, then you know he's not fit to be your pastor. His children can't be accused of riotous, of being riotous or unruly. Riot just means uh, basically going and partying. Okay, the dictionary definition of, of it is uproar, wild and noisy festivity, excessive and expensive feasting, partying. That's not what his children are associated with. They're not riot and unruly. Okay, now we could look at younger children and, and say, are they riot and unruly? I mean, are they running, bouncing off the walls and everything? I mean, look for that stuff. Is that what's going on with them? They need to be trained. Train children how to be in church. That's what you want to look for with him. Now, obviously, um, if it's, if it's a, a pastor and he's got still growing children, the wife's going to be dealing with that stuff while he's preaching. But look here, let me say something else. If, if I've, I've done it before, actually, but if a man's preaching and his children are out of order, he's, he'll stop right then, the, the message, and be like, hey, you two stop. Sit down and be quiet. And what should happen? They obey. Look, if you're afraid as a parent to do that, that tells me one thing. If you say, if I did that, my children wouldn't listen to me. That tells me one thing. And I'm not trying to be mean to anybody here. I'm telling you right now. From the bottom of my heart. But what that proves to me is that you're not training your children at home. Amen. That's all it proves. Now again, every child... It's going to push their limits, and they may do that. And, you know, it's like, all right, Mama, you need to go deal with them right now. And that happens. They done, not, not, no, no child's perfect. But look, if it's constant that you can never tell your child to do something and they wouldn't do it, it tells me they are not being trained. And you say, you're being mean, Pastor. I'm like, no, I'm just showing you what you've proven, what has been proven if that happens. And there's, I've seen some wild... Man, there's some missionaries we've had we won't support because I got the report back from my wife about how the children behaved. And I'm like, no, that just, hey, I love the guy, but we won't support them because of how the children behave. And it went beyond that. I know other churches, same thing, same report. So it wasn't just like they had a bad day here. It was the same thing. So our training is so important. But if, if I was up here and my children were misbehaving, I have every confidence that if I told them to be quiet, they would. Because I've trained them as such. And it's not easy and you can't be lazy. you got to get up now. i got to get up and go whoop you. I don't want to do this. Great. And here's something, just let me throw this parenting tip out. After you've dealt with your children... Here's what you want to do when you go to punish them. Some people are like, that, 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 you know, disobedience is worth, you know, three spanks. I'm like, I never counted spanks. Okay, that, throw that out the window. That's gone. Just get rid of that. That type, that thinking's wrong. Here's what you want to do. You whoop them until you break their will. If it's a thousand, it's a thousand. If it's one, it's one. Every child's different. My older girls, they were broken before I even whooped them. But I'd still whoop them to teach them. I'd give them one or two so that they knew there's... It's because they got whooped that they were already broken because they knew that this hurts and I don't like it. So I wanted them to know that disobedience was wrong and it needs to, it's going to be punished. But they were already broken, so it didn't take a lot for them. Other children, it was more. Okay? But you had to break their will. And this is important. You break their will, not their spirit. Amen. Now, with a strong-willed child, it's going to be hard. Amen. It is going to be hard to break their will. But here's the th this is the hardest part about it. If you don't break their will, you've only strengthened it. Yep. Amen. And it'll get harder. And they say, I cannot last them. And their little head. 
two years old fighting you, for having to put him in a leg lock. Been there, done that. They'll say, I cannot last this old man. And you'll strengthen their will. You've got to break it. You break their will. And the next time, it'll be way easier. And the time after that, it'll be even easier and easier. But you have to. You've got to get after them. And here's the thing to do. Here's where I was go going with all of this. When your children disobey you, after I would deal with them, I would immediately, and I hated doing this because I didn't want to. I was lazy as a parent and didn't want to do it again. But I would do this every time. Is after I'd whoop them, and we'd talk and pray. And it was always mostly, you know, 98% of the time, I, I wasn't angry in there. Um, because I wouldn't allow myself to go in if I was mad. I'd wait till I was ready. But after the whooping, we prayed, they prayed. I'd tell them what they did was sin, it was wrong, you sinned against God. I'm teaching them that it's sin, that it's wrong, that sin is punished. Okay, but after I was done, I'd immediately ask them to go do something else. To see if they got it. Are you going to obey me? And here's the thing. Sometimes they didn't listen. And we had to go through it all again. Because here's the thing, you're training them to be in subjection to you. Why do I want them in subjection to me? So they'll be in subjection to Him. Amen. So I'd go through the whole thing again. Whole process. Awful, I didn't want to do it. I hated doing it. And then when it was over, I'd ask him again. Go pick up that cup over there and put it over here. And sometimes, after the second time, they wouldn't obey me. And I'd have to go do it again. Most parents won't even do it the first time. They'll whoop them once or twice and think they did it but the child's will isn't broken and you just strengthened it. And now they know I can deal with that little whooping and still get what I want. You're training them. Just be strong enough. Be strong enough and you can get anything you want. You just, you'll always have your way. You're training them. You gotta break their will. As I said, all these qualifications are good for all of us. Every parent ought to rule well their own house. Amen. Every parent. And every husband ought to rule well his whole house. And every wife ought to be in subjection to her husband. But if we truly want to help our children, that's what we need to do. We need to be willing to train them and teach them. If a man is incapable of ruling his own house, he has no business over the house of God. This is a protection for the sheep individually and the Lord's churches as a whole by having unqualified men. When any of these qualifications are ignored and a man's put in that place, it's going to hurt God's people. It's going to. We can't ignore that. So that's looking at a pastor must be blameless in his family life. And what it means to rule well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity, having faithful children, the husband of one wife. And God gave the most attention, or at least the most word count to that. And I, I didn't spend as much time on it because I've already at length dealt with all of this stuff in the last year, uh, teaching on the family and things like that. But I say all this to help us, to help all of us. And all these qualifications are good for each of us. Now next week we're going to look at a bishop being blameless in his ministry life. Okay, and a lot of this comes down, to all of it really, to being able to discipline himself. If he can discipline himself, then he'll take care of his personal life, he'll take care of his family life, he'll take care of his ministry life. And that's what we need to do, because in all of it we have to do things we don't like. 
We have to do hard things. Again, this is good for all of us. So are we ruling well our own houses, whether we're going to be a pastor or not? You say, well, my house is just me. Good. Are you ruling well yourself? We all need that. Are we putting ourselves in subjection to our Father? It's a good question for us.